been my great privilege to serve in pastoral ministry for 35 years. It'll be in December next month. And one of the things that I have realized, among other things, many other things, is that every single person that I've ever encountered and had some kind of spiritual conversation, they, there is something inside of them that wants to understand what happens when they die. Now, they may say that in different ways, and you've had conversations. Uh, I've had conversations with people who uh, even, even uh, may doubt the reality of the afterlife. But there's still something there. And the reason there is something there is that God's Word says that God has put eternity in their hearts. Every single person, there is this desire to know what's going to happen when I die. Now in this series, uh, small series, uh, inside the big series of the good book, we've been studying about Jesus Christ being our leader, one who we follow. And the Lord Jesus has uh, created the universe. Uh, he's created us. We're here for a reason. He came so that we could know God and know how to have a relationship with him through the work that he did on the cross Dealing with our sin problem. That's why Jesus came to save sinners. If anybody asks you, why did Jesus come? What was his purpose, his mission? It was to save sinners. To pay the penalty, the price for sin. We should have paid it. He did. And so he, he has uh, led us to the cross where he died instead of us. But he's also gone to heaven. And he wants to lead us to heaven. Now, there's, there's a thing there, there that has to happen. We, we, it just doesn't automatically happen. And so today, I want us to understand uh, several things about what happens when we die. And so, if you will, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation is the last chapter in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to look at chapter 21. And in a minute, I'm going to re a reference, I'll tell the story briefly of Luke chapter 16. But there are three overarching facts that, that concern this question and the message today. Here's number one. Heaven and hell are literal places. Heaven and hell are both literal places. And I'll develop that thought in just a few moments. <clears throat> Secondly... When we die, everyone will go to one of two places immediately. There is a heaven and hell. And when we die, anybody dies, everyone will go to one of two places immediately. Third, we will stay in that state eternally. We will stay in that state eternally. It doesn't change. It won't get worse and it won't get better. All right? So those are the three arching facts that we need to understand as it relates to uh, what happens when a person dies. Now, in the Bible, there is a development of thought concerning what happens when we die. And you need to remember that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew because it related to the Jews. And so the early thoughts about death, uh, about life after death, developed initially with the Jews as we have it concerning God's Word. And so the Jews would use a word called Sheol, that a person died and would go to Sheol. That was just a general term for the place of the dead. didn't matter who you were, all right? Everybody would go to Sheol, to the place of the dead. There wasn't much thought about heaven or hell uh, in the early days that we find in God's Word. During the intertestinal period, the Jews began to use some words that would help define the difference between heaven and hell. And we see those three words used in the New Testament. The first word is the word Hades. Uh, it's interpreted as hell, but the actual word is the word Hades. And I'll come back to that in just a few moments. All right, we've all heard that word. The second word is the word Gehenna. The word Gehenna. That word is used several times in the New Testament. And it, it will be translated hell. Uh, in the English translation, but the actual word is Gehenna. Now, the Gehenna comes from 
uh, the Valley of Hinnom, all right, in Jerusalem. When you look at, if you look at a map and you see the old city of David, the old city of Jerusalem, and the walls that are around Jerusalem, to the right is a valley called the Kidron Valley. Across that valley is the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, Bethany, all right? Jesus, on his last week, the Passion Week, would come in and out from that Mount of Olives, cross the Kidron Valley, and go into the city of Jerusalem. On the other side, there is another valley that comes in and meets the Kidron Valley. That valley is the Hinnon Valley. Now, uh, that, at that day and time, during Jesus' time, it was a garbage dump. Uh, it was there that in pagan days, there were uh, uh, sacrifices made of babies thrown into this uh, place, this valley, as a sacrifice to the pagan god Moloch. So they were very familiar with the pagan practice. Uh, dead animals were thrown into this valley. Criminals who were executed, who had no place to be buried, then they were thrown into this valley as well, and all the refuse from the city of Jerusalem. It was a constant fire that burned the entire time. Smoke was always rising from this valley. So you have the Valley of Hinnom, the Valley of Gehenna. That word is used to reference hell. When Jesus would use this word very specifically in the New Testament, and I'll read some of those verses, they all knew what he was talking about. Then there is the words only used one time in 2 Peter, and it's the word Tartarus. It's also made in reference to hell. And it, that word is used specifically as a place in hell reserved for the fallen angels. So when it comes to hell, uh, the development of thought makes it very clear that it wasn't just Sheol anymore, a place of the dead, but there was a place for those who uh, did not follow God. They would spend eternity in hell, referenced by these three words. Then you also have on the other side is the word paradise and the word heaven. Those two words are used for those who are followers of God and that they would ultimately go to heaven. But I want to speak technically a little bit about that because there's some confusion about what happens to a person when they die and where do they go, whether they're an unbeliever or a believer. Uh, so technically, from what I believe and others would believe in, in the development of thought, is that, that a person currently who dies and is unbeliever would go to Hades. A person who dies and is a believer who will go currently to paradise. So what that means is, is that that is somewhat of an interim state. All right? So when a, a believer dies, he's going to go to paradise, but he is ultimately going to be in heaven. There's no real difference between paradise and heaven. Jesus is in paradise right now. When a person dies, they're going to go and be with Jesus in paradise. That's what he told the thief on the cross. But ultimately, that's going to be heaven. Then a person is in Hades, and they are conscious. They are aware that they are there. They know that there is suffering. Uh, it's very intense. They are much aware of that. They are not with God. They are separated from God. And then they are ultimately going to be in hell. There's no real difference. Well, then what is the difference? The only difference between the two is that they don't have their resurrected body. A person who is an unbeliever, who is in Hades, when Jesus comes, uh, excuse me, let's start with the believer. When the believer is in paradise and Jesus comes, those bodies are going to be resurrected at the second coming of Christ. Then they have the judgment seat of Christ where they are judged. Judged according for their works. They're already judged concerning the eternal destiny. That judgment took place here when you gave your heart to Christ. You can't do that in heaven. You can't do that somewhere else. To determine where you will spend eternity will happen here. All right? Then, a thousand years after the second coming of Christ, that's the millennial reign of Christ, then the Bible says that there's what's called the great white throne. Those who are dead, who are unbelievers, they are resurrected. They stand before God, and then they are cast into hell forever. They have their resurrected body. So the difference between Hades and hell, paradise and heaven, is the resurrected body. Does that make sense? Because somebody's going to ask, the word paradise is used, heaven is used, the word Hades, the word hell, that's what it means. So it's, it's you know, Hades and hell is bad. Paradise and heaven 
is good. The difference only is the resurrected body. Now, with that, I want to go to God's Word. Luke 16, let me just tell you the story. There is this uh, parable. Some believe that it may be uh, historically true, this conversation that happens. At least we believe that there are things in the story that tell us some things about heaven and hell. It's about Lazarus, the poor man, and the rich man who die. Both of them die. The, the, poor, the rich man goes to hell. The uh, poor man, Lazarus, goes to heaven. He is with Abraham. Specifically, the father Abraham that we know of the Old Testament. There is a conversation that takes place between the two. How bad it is, the, poor man, the rich man says it is in hell. And, and then this conversation with Lazarus who is with Abraham. The conversation is with Abraham, not with Lazarus. Abraham and the rich man who was in hell. Then in Revelation 21, let's go to Revelation 21. You're at 22, but back up to 21. And let me read the first five uh, first eight verses there, all right? Here, John, the Apostle John, he has been exiled to the island of Patmos because of his faith in Christ. There he has this vision. The whole book is the vision. And he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea existed no longer. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will exist no longer. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer. Because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Right, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the thirsty from the spring of living water as a gift. The victor will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowards, the unbelievers, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, really he's referring to all who are unrepentant, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now let's go to chapter 22, verse 1. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then he showed me the river of living water. He talked about this water. Uh, stream of living water in, in what I just read now he makes it more specific he showed me the river of living water sparkling like crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the broad street of the city the new Jerusalem on both sides of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit producing its fruit every month the leaves of the tree are for healing the nations and there will no longer be any curse the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. Night will no longer exist, and people will not need lamp light or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. We long for that day. All right. Now, with that, there are several things that I want us to notice, several truths, all right? First of all, very obviously, everyone dies. Everyone dies. In Luke 16, the rich man dies, the poor man dies. Everybody dies. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for a man to die once, and then comes the judgment. No reincarnation, no second chance. Everybody dies. They all die one time. Now, uh, the issue there is that we act as though we're going to live forever here on earth and there are a lot of people outside these walls who act as though they're going to live forever in their quiet moments they know they're not in their very quiet moments they know they're not going to last forever and so that's why they're asking they're asking themselves they're asking other people they're reading books they're watching movies they're all the rest they, they're fascinated by the things of the afterlife. Uh, they'll, they'll hear stories of those who've had near-death experiences, all the rest. They're interested in those things. 
Secondly, as I mentioned, everyone goes to one of two places. Uh, one, as obviously, is hell. Well, we don't know the exact location of hell at all. Some believe that it is down in the earth. The rich man in the story of Luke 16, he looked up. In Luke 10, 15, Jesus said, you will go down to Hades. We also know it is a prison from 1 Peter 3 and Revelation 20. It's locked with the key and Jesus holds the key. Uh, Revelation 1, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 3 refer to that. Hell is a place of torment and agony. In Luke chapter 16, it makes it very clear there is great suffering there. Uh, now, with that idea of hell, in uh, our time in Israel, we went to a place called Caesarea Philippi. There's Caesarea by the sea, Caesarea Maritime. Uh, Herod the Great built that great port city. Uh, Paul left from there to go to Rome, where he was ultimately imprisoned and executed. Uh, but Caesarea Philippi is in the northern part of uh, Israel. And while we were there, uh, it's a fascinating place. And it is there, at, at, when you stand there, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples, specifically with Peter. This is, this is the scene. He's standing there at Caesarea Philippi, the Bible says, and he says, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some believe that you're John the Baptist, some believe that you're Elijah, or that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And he says, Peter, on that confession, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. At Caesarea Philippi, while he is saying that, in the background is a cave that is known as the gates of hell. It was another pagan place of worship where there were sacrifices made there. Uh, there, before the earthquake, there was a stream of water that was coming out, and that is the origin, that whole area, in fact, the origin of the Jordan River leading into the Sea of Galilee. Caesarea Philippi, the gates of hell, and there, look, they know exactly what he's referring to. That that cave, they believed, was the entry point into hell, the gates of hell. And Jesus says... That my church is not going to be stopped. The gates of hell cannot stop what I am going to do through my people, the church of the living God. And so it's very real. Jesus is helping them understand that hell is a reality uh, in many other ways that he makes that very clear. So then we look at heaven. Several things about heaven that we see in Revelation 21. First of all, for those who are interested... You have a new relationship with God. In verse 3 it says that God's dwelling is with men and he will live with them. He's going to dwell with them. He's going to tabernacle. That's the actual word. Uh, when we see in John chapter 1 that he, Jesus Christ came, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The same word, he tabernacled. He came with us. So what happens is that our relationship with God is restored as it was with Adam and Eve in the garden. God walked with them. He will live with them. So in the end of it all, after the thousand-year reign of Christ, we're going to see a new heaven and a new earth. That means that we're not in heaven out there. That heaven is coming. There's a new earth. He's making all things new. And Jerusalem is coming down. There's a new state of affairs in verse 4. He says, the previous things have passed away. I'm making everything new. We can't begin to imagine what that is going to be. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, Paul says, What no eye has seen and no ear has heard, and what has never come into a man's heart is what God has prepared for those who love him. The difference between the old and the new is as vast as the difference between the old Adam and the new Adam. The old Adam in the garden and the new Adam, Jesus Christ. Vastly different. Notice in verse 4, there are no tears, no death, no grief, no crying, no pain. And what I love about it is God is the one who wipes away the tears. God will be the one that we stand before and he'll wipe away any tears. There's a new community of people. 
The Bible says in verse 3, they will be his people. Peter writes it like this, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. I made reference to the new Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is a historical city. It also will be part of the millennial. It's a millennial city. It's the uh, heavenly city, but it's not heaven. It, the new Jerusalem is coming to a new earth, and it's going to be the base of operation for all of eternity with a new heaven and a new earth. If you go on into Revelation 21, God gives more detail about what it's going to be like. He gives us the size of Jerusalem in the new heaven, the new earth. Uh, now, that could be metaphorically, he's using these numbers, but it could be literal. If it were to be literal, the new Jerusalem is going to be from New York to Denver to Mexico City to Miami back to New York. Just, just 1,500 cubits. Just Jerusalem itself, this new uh, city uh, on a new earth. There'll be a new method of worship in verse 22. He says, I did not see a sanctuary in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. There'll be no temple. There'll be no church. There'll be no meeting place. The whole place is so full of God, I don't have to go anywhere to a place that I will worship God. It will be constant worship, among other things. There will be new conditions there in heaven. Verse 23, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. God's doing it all. We just show up and enjoy it. And we're going to have responsibilities in heaven. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. There are rewards that will be given. What you believe determines where you spend eternity. What you do while you're here will determine the quality of that experience, whether you're in heaven or in hell. There's a new paradise, as we see in Revelation 22. A river of living water, a tree of life. There's no danger of being cast out. There's no danger of death. There's no danger of sin or Satan. He will not be there. So the point is, is that everyone will go to one of two places. Hell or heaven. Now, hell and heaven are separated forever. In Luke 16, here's what Jesus says. A great chasm has been, or Abraham says, a, a great chasm has been fixed between us, uh, us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot, neither can those from there cross over to us. So he says there's this great chasm. It's a fixed chasm. The two will never meet. You cannot travel back and forth. Now, that's good news and bad news. It's bad news for those in hell. It's good news for those in heaven. Who wants to cross over and go there? No, we don't want that. Heaven and hell also exist forever. Revelation 22, 5, it says they will reign forever and ever. But also, hell is forever. Mark 9, 48, Jesus says this in referencing hell. He uses the word Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom. It's a place where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Now, he's, ma he's making a reference. They knew the valley. They knew it was the garbage dump. They knew the fire is never quenched and the worm is always there decaying that which is there. He says that is what hell will be like. The fire, the worm never dies. The fire is never quenched. Jesus said in Matthew 25, it is an eternal fire. Revelation 20 like a fire there will be torment day and night forever and ever. Hey, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. And so the same words that are used to talk about the eternality of heaven are the very same words that are used to talk about the eternality of hell. There's no such thing as annihilation. Some believe that somehow that those who are in hell will ultimately be annihilated. Or that when they die, they don't even experience hell, that they're annihilated. I mean, they just stop existing. The Bible makes no reference to that whatsoever. If words mean anything, then it makes it very clear, the words that Jesus used, that both are for all of eternity. That means forever means forever. Also, it means I cannot do anything about those already in hell. No help could be given in Luke chapter 16 with Lazarus and the poor man, a rich man. And I can't do anything about those 
who are not yet uh, are in hell already. But I can do something about those who are not yet in hell. Now, why did this man go to hell in the Bible, Luke 16? It wasn't because he was rich. Abraham was rich. He went to heaven. Abraham was one of the most wealthy men of all the Bible. So it wasn't his money that determined where he was going to spend eternity. He rejected the scriptures. More specifically, he rejected the God of the scriptures. A person will not spend eternity with God for one reason. That's because they have rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So let me wrap this up with a few things. Death is already defeated. That's the good news. Death is already defeated defeated death is existence without God and without his presence that's what death really is it doesn't mean that I stop existing it means that I'm existing but I'm not in God's presence that's death life is existence with God's presence that's the difference Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that death is the final festival on our road to freedom Death is the final festival on our road to freedom. That's how we need to see death. It's just a transition point. So what happens the moment that I die or that you die? There's no purgatory. There's no soul sleep. There's no intermediate state. We either go to Jesus and be with him forever or we spend eternity in hell. Now how fast does that happen? 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, We are confident and satisfied to be out of the body and at home with the Lord. If I'm out of the body, I'm going to be with the Lord. Philippians 1, Paul says, I have the desire to part and be with Christ. I'll be with him. Remember, as I said to the thief on the cross, from this day on, this moment, you will be with me in paradise. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Concerning the resurrection at the second coming. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, then we'll be changed. The word moment, we get our word atom. That means time cannot be divided. Now, I know we've split atoms, but in that day and time, they had not done that. So the the point is, time cannot be divided whatsoever. that, That quick, that's going to happen. So, listen, heaven should make us happy. When we read Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, that ought to make us very happy. It ought to give us great confidence. It ought to give us great assurance. It ought to give us great hope to know that it's not just heaven in my future, but Jesus has already said on the Sermon on the Mount that we are now citizens in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. We're in his kingdom. Heaven has come to us. Eternity has already come to us. And we're living uh, to a limited degree in that reality that God is with us. We are in his presence in a spiritual state. One day we'll be in his presence in a physical state. So let's go back to the three facts that I mentioned earlier. If heaven and hell are real. And if I go to one of two places when I die. And if I stay there forever, and if I really believe that, then what am I doing about that? What are you doing about that? If I really, really believe that. Well, for the Christian, it means that we're telling others about the hope of heaven. We're telling others that they can go to heaven. It's telling others that you can experience the God of heaven now. That he can help you right now with what's going on in your life. Because here's why that's important. A lot of people, though they know that there's something that's going to happen when they die, are really more focused on what's happening in the hell they're living in right now. And they want to find some piece of heaven today. And that's why the message of the gospel is so important. Isn't it true in your life? With all the things that you're facing. To know that in the midst of it all. He's given me joy. Because I know that he is with me. That he is in control. 
that I can trust him and I have his peace in my heart. Paul said, a peace that passes all understanding. There might be somebody here today who would say, well, pastor, how do I get to heaven? I don't have the assurance that if I died today that I would go to heaven. Well, the Bible's very clear about that. It is not confusing. It's a matter of making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's not just believing in your mind. Remember what it says in James. You believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. They tremor when they understand who Jesus is. So there are people who know about him, but they don't know him. And that means that I need to know the facts about Jesus that he died for me, a sinner. He took my place. He satisfied God's wrath against sin. And that I don't have to pay for my sin with my life for all of eternity. But it means that he did that for me. And now I turn my life over to him. He becomes Lord of my life. We call, we, that word is repentance. I turn from going my way and I turn and I'm now going his way. So I'm going to ask you today, there might be somebody here who's saying, I'm willing to make that commitment of my life. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And if you're here today and you want to know with assurance that you're going to spend eternity in heaven and that you're wanting not just to pray a prayer, but to make the commitment to follow Christ, then I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer quietly in your heart as I pray it out loud. You may not know what to say or do. And this is why I want to help you do that. And all I'm doing is helping you verbalize the desire of your heart to make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So you repeat this prayer quietly in your heart as I pray it out loud. Dear Lord, thank you for loving me. I know that I'm a sinner. But I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. I also believe he rose again on the third day. Right now, I ask you to come into my heart to forgive me of my sin and help me as I follow you. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. Help me each day to live for you in Jesus' name. I want you to keep your head, bows, head bowed and your eyes closed. The Bible says that he who believes has eternal life. The word believe there doesn't mean just, again, intellectually. It means with your heart, with your life. So you can have that assurance today. There might be somebody here, though, that would say, Pastor, I know the Lord, but, but I'm not living in the reality of God's presence in my life. And... It's, it's been hard. And this message today has helped me refocus my attention that there is a great hope for me. And so I want to make the most of the opportunity I have now. And I want to handle the problems of my life in a way that will honor Him and be used as a testimony to His saving grace in my life. The Lord understands all that you're going through. He's just ready for you to say, all right, Lord, I'm ready to get back in the game. I'm ready to come home. I'm, I'm ready to just do it your way like I, I knew years ago. And he's going to love you into that. He's going to help you. There might be others that maybe in just a moment when we have a time of response, you need to come and just pray here at the front by yourself. Or maybe you want somebody to pray for you uh, to help you. As you're just sorting through some things. Maybe you didn't pray that prayer, but you have questions about it. And you'd like to talk to somebody. Then we want to help you with that. Father, I thank you for the reality of your word. And the reality of all that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. That you've prepared a place for us. As you said. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Don't let your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many rooms. And I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Father, thank you for that assurance. 
that you've provided a place for us. You're there now. And one day you're going to come back for us. So Father, help us to live a life that glorifies you. And may we express it in the way that we live, in the way that we praise you, we worship you. Even now as we respond to you in Jesus' name, amen.